and invites you to follow along in an order of worship that can be found at peachtree.org under the media tab. And for those who are here worshiping with us in our sanctuary, welcome. Please uh, take a moment and fill out the black welcome pads that are found in the uh, center aisles um, and pass those down so you can greet those around you and know who's here. And especially if you're visiting with us this morning, we'd just like to reach out to you and thank you for being here this morning. I'd like to call your attention to a number of things going on in the life of our church. We are a community of care, a community of reconciliation. We want to reach out and invite all people into our uh, gathering, into our community. And so tonight we have a special uh, treat for us. We have an evensong service in the chapel, which is every Sunday evening at 5 p.m. But immediately following that, right here in the sanctuary, we have Not Your Mummy's organ concert. And so you will... Uh, have the treat of hearing our organist, Count Herbert Buffington, uh, give some of the spookiest Halloween music. Um, and so please invite your friends and come. That is 6.30. Prior to that, we'll have some refreshments um, outside if the weather holds up. So again, we're thankful that you are here worshiping with us this morning. Uh, let us now prepare our hearts for worship during the organ prelude. Fifty-nine. This is my father's world, if you'd like to open that now. And please also open your order of worship to our call to worship. Please stand and respond with the bold text. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul.
gathered here that we have divine appointments with you. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you be here with us in all things, through our prayers and our praise, through our supplications, through the laments and cries of our heart. God, be with us and speak to us as we put ourselves under the authority of your Holy Scripture and as we answer your call to be invited around your table. Be with us in bread and cup. Be with us as we embrace one another. God, in this moment, we now fix our attention and gaze upon your Son, our Savior Christ, who teaches us how to follow you and how to live. We think now of Christ and how he taught his disciples to pray boldly, saying, and we say now, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's printed in your order of worship. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. I 
invite you now to share the peace of Christ with those around you, saying, Peace be with you. Together is number 405 in memory of the Savior's love. Please remain seated as we sing together. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith.
$6,000 uh, from Peachtree to go toward the work of Haggai International. And let me remind you once again that 100% of our outreach and missions is funded from your giving at this time in the service. And so because of your faithful giving right now in these kinds of moments, we are able to expand and continue the good work through places like Haggai International and other organizations throughout the world. And so will you give me a warm peach tree welcome for Dr. Davis. Thank you, Jared. I had a chance to at attend your uh, early morning service and was welcomed there and then went to a fabulous Sunday school class and have felt welcomed. Uh, my wife and I have felt so welcomed since we came in to the doors of this wonderful church. At Haggai International, we believe that um, the way that God has called us to reach out to the world, to transform nations, to bring the gospel, is to identify high-level Christian leaders within emerging nations and to equip and train them to live out the gospel, to present the gospel to others, and to train others to do the same. And we've been unwavering in that passion for over 50 years. We began our partnership with Peachtree Christian in 1995. At that time, there were 23,000 Haggai leaders presenting and living out the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Today, there are 120,000 Haggai leaders in over 189 different nations. Over the last 25 years, in addition to your annual gifts, you've also sponsored 30 leaders. And in the gathering space, there is a map of, uh, of where all those leaders are located in the world, and you can see what they're doing. But I can share briefly with you that they're out there, that they're building schools for refugees, they're planting churches, they're running orphanages in Africa, and they're rescuing abandoned ISIS wives in the Middle East. Let me share with you one story. There's a region in north, northeast India known as Nagaland. Does anybody know where Nagaland is? Chance, some of you do. It's in the north where India and China, Myanmar, and in this part of the world, 2.1 billion people who've never lived. And yet in Nagaland, 90% of the population is Christian. On January 11, 1999, Peachtree Christian Church sponsored a leader for training. At the time, John McIntyre was the mission's chairperson. The leader selected was Fogoto Sima of India. And after his Haggai leader experience, his 25-day training, he went to Nagaland, where God called him, to encourage the poor, to build schools, and today works in local politics on issues re racial reconciliation. He is a wonderful, faithful extension of this church's ministry in the world. All of us at Haggai International are so grateful for you. Well, we're grateful for the spiritual leadership of this congregation and for your outstanding pastoral leadership, Jared Wartman and Dr. Longbaum. We're grateful for you and the trust that you place in the leaders of this congregation, and we're deeply honored by the trust that they place in us. If you'd like to know more about Haggai International, you can visit or how to visit our Mid-Pacific Center in Maui, be a guest or be a volunteer. I'll be in the gathering space after the worship service, and I'd love an opportunity to greet you and to personally say thank you for all that you do to make this church a great church and for the part that you play in helping us fulfill
express our gratitude for you and for all that you show us, what it means to love and care, and to extend your goodness, your good news, to every corner of your creation. We are grateful for Haggai International and, and the many others that we work with, with that, that labor long and tirelessly so that your good news may be made known in ways that are real, tangible, and close to hand. We ask that you bless these gifts, so that we would be able to continue to give as a community, so that faith, hope, and love would always be true and real, wherever we go and wherever we give. It is in Jesus' name and in gratitude that we pray always, in thanksgiving. Please remain standing for the reading of Scripture. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Friends, it's certainly a joy to worship with you, or if you are streaming, we're so happy that you can stream and be present that way or watch on demand. Thank you for being here on this beautiful day. I wish to extend my note of apology to Reverend David Davis, who tried to present beautifully to us, but we had a problem with the one area where you can always expect a problem in a church, our sound system. So if you didn't get to hear him clear enough, please do visit them out in the gathering space. I, I do want you to know you've noticed the past several weeks, um, most of the ministers have had to use handheld mics for whatever reason. Uh, just so you know, my microphone pack seems to work fairly okay. The others don't. I am told that with the new buildings going up around us, it seems as though channels become polluted more and more and more, and so we are in need to address these issues. We hope that you will bear with us, and uh, from time to time, maybe giggle in your head as you think of Jared Wortman kind of crooning you, you know? No? Okay. I thought it was funny. Imagining Jared Wortman as a crooner makes me smile. When I'm sad, it's good to be with you. This weekend is chock full at Peachtree Christian Church. If you didn't know it, we have lovingly called this weekend Halloween Weekend. Friday night you could have come and watched Frankenstein with Ryan Stewart and the film club and had theological conversation. Yesterday, if you had a pet, you could have come to a pet blessing ceremony. We, we blessed two Irish wolfhounds. Have you ever seen these creatures? These things are taller than me. It was remarkable. Today, of course, we've had our children's events outside riding ponies and painting pumpkins. And, well, tonight, after Evensong, we have our wonderful, wonderfully planned, the person who came up with this brilliant idea to have Herb Buffington do spooky songs on the organ. Does that sound fun or what? It was my idea. So you see the candles up and around. We're going to have it low lit here. We're going to have costumes if you want to. I mean, we're not going to provide you with a costume. But you can come with a costume if you like. Katie, I'm counting on you to make sure I'm not the only one. I'll be in character all night. And you might just hear something thrilling. So please come bring your friends at 630 for that wonderful concert. For now, friends, let us begin with a word of prayer before we reflect on this interesting parable from Jesus. Creator God, we are thankful for the life that you have given us. And we confess together that we haven't always been so faithful with that gift. In fact, we believe that your son Christ stepped into our mess 
to reconcile us to you. And so we are thankful. We believe in our hearts and confess with our lips that your son Christ is cultivating in us even now a desire for kingdom living. In like manner, you've sent your Holy Spirit to counsel us and guide us along the journey to help us become a community of care. Thank you for this gift as well. God, we pray for a special and fresh outpouring of your spirit now, for you and I know that without you I can do nothing. So we ask that you take this little story and let it live big in our hearts and transform us, that we may be transformational agents where we go in this world. It is in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, we pray, and all God's people say together, Amen. What is Jesus up to? Sometimes, if I'm honest, I wish that he would be less dangerous. Maybe even just a little bit more predictable. Especially when I read Luke. Luke has a way of telling the story about Jesus that just makes all of our expectations turn upside down, which is it's not comforting. Because if there's one thing I've learned about being married and doing marriage counseling for people, it's this, that conflict often arises from unmet expectations. But the way Jesus speaks in Luke, he's always flipping them upside down. Here is Jesus again telling a little story. That's innocent enough, isn't it? I mean, a story is just that. It's a story. And stories are nice, aren't they? I mean, can you think of anything more domestic and non-threatening than a story? Apparently not. You see, this story is a tale about two worshipers at the temple. Now, we could exchange some words here to make it understandable for us culturally it might begin like this there were two men in church pretty straightforward the word church here helps us it gives us a certain listening clue it opens our imagination for what to expect if they're in church then there's a sense of decorum they probably are participating in maybe they've even come for the same purpose Certainly these two different men have probably enacted some sense of filter over the behavior because it's a place for reverence. Isn't that right, church? A place for reverence? I remember when I was a boy, I used to sit in the back pew against the back wall of a little country church with about four or five other, as John Jim Bell would call them, ring-tailed tutors. One of them was the youth leader's kid, and he was a real crack-up. And he brought the holy grail of novelty items with him to church. A whoopee cushion. And he made that whoopee cushion go off in Sunday school. But his, his parent didn't care because she was a bit of a cut up too. She just made him promise not to use it at any inappropriate times. He got that whoopee cushion out during service. I got nervous. But he was just kind of holding it and smelling the odd rubber smell. And then it came time in the service for the offering. Now, something happened every Sunday at this church during offering. A head usher named Otis Wallace, a man I dearly loved before he passed, he would bring the offering up. Otis was a sweet character. He always wore suspenders. And whenever I'd see him, he'd, he'd open one breast of his jacket, and it would say, Otis. And then he'd open the other side, and it would say, Wallace. Otis had a funny way of speaking. He wasn't loud, but you could hear him when he said S words because he made a really loud whistle. And so he'd stand in front of the altar with the offering and he'd say a prayer. And he wasn't mic'd, so no one could hear him, but you could always hear his, his whistles. And we'd laugh at him in the back because we were evil children. <laughs> it got particularly quiet in between the S's of Otis's prayer, and I was caught off guard to hear it too. My friend crushed the whoopee cushion and everybody's head jerked up from the prayers and I could see the pastor looking over Otis and then my friend's mom sitting halfway up the sanctuary turned around and said for Christ's sake boy not in church church 
a place for reverence. I think we can assume the two men are there for the same reasons and they're being reverent and they're not causing problems. But it's these two men's presence in church where the comparison truly ends because you see one of them has a title, a well-known title. He is a Pharisee. And the other has another well-known title. He is a tax collector. Or as they called them in the old days, and maybe some of your Bibles refer to them as such, a publican. Which to me is a very funny sounding word, so I will say it again for my own amusement. Publican. And I know, friends, that in this room there is probably a bias against Pharisees. I know that because you and I are in the same cultural situation. We live on this side of the New Testament. We've gone back and we looked over the pages of the Gospels and we've seen time after time that these people tend to be enemies of Jesus or Jesus' foils for his stories and, and parables. But we have to remember something profoundly important. For the people of God in this day, the Pharisees were the good guys. They wore the white hat in the story. They were upstanding. Some of the very first Christian followers of Jesus were Pharisees. These were people who followed the law. These were the people who kept their fingernails clean. They called their mamas on Sunday. They did all the right things. If I'm going to be crass about it, the Pharisee is exactly the person that you would want to have in your church. Listen to his prayer. God, thank you. Thank you that I, uh, I've lived a righteous life. Thank you that, 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 that I fast and, and that I'm able to do the things you want me to do. There is no reason to think that the words of his prayer are false. He goes further. He even says, God, I, I, I've given my 10%. I'm telling you what, this is the guy that pastors want in their church. He even gives 10%. That's the gold standard. If we could get everyone here to give 10%, there would be no issue with our budget. He gives it, and he's faithful, and he fasts, and he follows the law. Here's the thing about this man. He has done all the right things. He's paid his time, and he knows it too. You have to be careful when we find ourselves following all the rules, doing the right things, paying our time, and also being aware of it. I was standing in a grocery store uh, aisle, a lane, I was trying to check out. There's a woman in front of me talking on her cell phone rather loudly. Now, I've encouraged you before, be careful what you say out loud. There are pastors in your community, and they listen, and then they preach sermons. So be careful. I heard her on the phone as I was looking at the tabloids, trying to act like I couldn't listen to what she was saying or couldn't hear her. And she said this, I'm so angry at my new young preacher. I got really interested then. He changed all the music at church. She said this then, I'm thinking of taking away my donation unless he changes the music have to be careful when we put in the time, when we've done all the right stuff, and we think we are in good with God, and we know it. Because it sen tends to create in us a sense of entitlement, a sense of self-righteousness, or what Father Richard War would call ego-driven spirituality. There's the tax Pharisee over there praying. But over here on the other side of the church sanctuary is the tax collector. What do we say about tax collectors? Well, for starters, my friends, they, they were people who worked for the Roman government, siphoning money away from their own people to line the pockets of a pagan empire. Oh, and they also often lined their own pockets as well. These people were not well thought of, to say the least. In fact, these were not the kinds of people you'd want to come to church. They were seen as enemies or those on the fringes. Sometimes they were downright despised. 
I know as I say that to you now, you probably don't have a good feeling in your stomach because when I say the right kind of person for church, what should pop into all our minds is anybody and everybody is the right kind of person for church. There is no target. The target is the world, right? Rest assured, we have nicer ways of excluding. I was once at a church growth seminar. Everybody that works in church is interested in growth. That is just the reality. Frankly, it's because our society is a society based on a, on a story of infinite growth. But that's another topic for another day. Nevertheless, I went to it, and it was put on by one of these uh, pastors of a mega church. So he started this church in his garage or something, and now it's got 20-some thousand people every Sunday. Uh, they're probably taking all the audio frequencies from other churches, you know. And everyone wants to know one thing. They just want to know one simple thing. How do you, how do you get that big? How do you grow? And then he stopped talking about the Bible and, and theological terms about the church. And he started using other phrases that came from the business world, like target audience and marketing. Immediately, I felt a little queasy and out of my element, because I never thought of the church as a business. And so then he began to say, you have to have a target audience to know how to get them in your door. Everyone was curious who his target audience was. And so he pulled up in a transparency. You guys remember transparencies that you could shine up on the wall? He pulled a transparency picture of the target audience of their church. And it was a white male between the ages of 35 and 45. He had a polo shirt tucked into khakis, a very large cell phone clipped to his belt. I think there was a lanyard around his neck. All of it was meant to signify something. He, he, was, he was kind of a suburban upwardly mobile person at a nice company. It said he had 2.3 kids. I don't know how you get a point three of a kid, but that was the statistic. Of course, they had a nice house, a picket fence, and he was married to uh, Betty Crocker or somebody. The first thing I thought in my mind was this. Well, what about me? I'm a single man. How do I fit into your church? And then I thought less egotistically. I thought, what about people of color? What about people who don't make that much money? What about women? We find ways, people, we do, to think about who is in and would be good for us and who would not. Let's just say in this day and age that we're referring to, the tax collector would have been on the out list easily. Still, there's a difference between the two men in church on that day. The Pharisee prays. He's thankful for his righteousness. And that he's not like a bunch of other people, adulterers. He's not like the rogues. I love it that he uses the word rogues. He, he isn't a scoundrel. And then, taking notice out of the corner of his eye of the tax collector, he even says, I'm really glad I'm not like the tax collector. I'm glad I, I'm not in a profession that hurts my people. Meanwhile, the tax collector is praying, and I'm convinced that he is unaware of the presence of the Pharisee. So busy is he crying and sobbing, the text tells us that he's actually beating his chest. He's thinking about all the things that he's done wrong, the ways that he hasn't lived up enough to who he's supposed to be. He's thought about his sin. And as he's crying and sobbing, and there's not, and it's not pretty, he beats his breast, crying out to God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. So seriously, he takes his own moment before God. Have you ever been so worried and serious about your sin that when you went to church, you beat your chest? And soft. Now I want you to know something and note it well. He doesn't really ask for forgiveness and offer repentance. The tax collector isn't saying, I promise I will change my ways. He's not giving God a three point plan. He's not bargaining. He is just declaring that he's a sinner. That's all he's doing humbly before God. 
And Jesus praises that man rather than the Pharisee. He critiques the Pharisee. Do you see how absurd this is, though? Absolutely absurd. I mean, the Pharisee isn't making this stuff up. He is righteousness. He really does the right things. I believe him. He gives 10% of his stuff away. He is faithful. And he's really happy that he's not in the kind of work that would harm his own people. I guess the economy really is working for him. Yet, Jesus sides with the sinner the con man, the financial parasite, the traitor, the cheat, the liar, or whatever word that you wouldn't label him with. Why? Why does Jesus side with such a man? I certainly think there's something about the fact that he's not hypocritical. There's nothing worse than somebody who's just blatantly hypocritical, is there? When somebody's so unaware of their blind spot, and it's pretty obvious, that it just rubs us wrong. I had a, a great Uncle Doc. He was a character. I could tell you stories about him that would go on days. He heard that I liked hip-hop music. In the era of time this was, the hip-hop of the day was pretty vulgar. And so he decided to sit me down and give me a lecture about vulgarity and speech. He told me that vulgarity was a sign of ignorance and stupidity. As soon as he said that, my dad rolled his eyes and goes, oh, come on, Doc. Because my dad knew the one truth about Doc, full of baloney. He continued on. He told me that whenever you talk like that, you sound stupid, so you better work on your vocabulary. Expand your vocabulary. In fact, for every one vulgar word, I needed to learn five non-vulgar words that meant the same thing. And he kept going on. And to be frank with you, it all sounded pretty smart to me. It made a lot of sense. And so I'm jiving with what he is saying. He's helping me become a cultured man. Then, in the middle of his speech, his 20-something layabout son, who was up late for his shift at the bar, was crawling out of his bedroom. He walked into the living room. His dad said something to him. He said something smart alecky to my Uncle Doc. And my Uncle Doc then took his cane and he whacked him with a sentence full of the most wonderful obscenities you've ever heard in your life. Just fell out of his mouth. And my dad rolled his eyes more. The hypocrisy weakened the point. Why does Jesus side with the tax collector? The lesson here is simple. To be very, very careful with how you look at, assess, judge, or account for the life of other people. If for no other reason, that it can make you miss your own misdeeds. But it's deeper than that too. You know, to be frank, the lesson here is that for the faithful, according to Jesus, must be so concerned First, with their own hang-ups, with their own sins, with their own misgivings and misdeeds, that they can barely see other people's. Be so concerned with yourself and how you're falling short that you don't have time to worry yourself with how other people are falling short. I love the tradition of the Desert Fathers and I'm going to steal a story Reverend Chambers told some time ago in a sermon. It was of a man named Abba Moses. And he's famously known for somebody who never wanted to judge another person because he was too busy working on his own sins. But he was called to be a part of a council to cast judgment on something that was done wrong or something like that. He didn't want to go, but he was called to do it. So he took a bucket put a little hole in the bottom of the bucket and filled it with water, and he walked that way to the meeting. When he got there, people looked at him kind of strangely and wondered why he was carrying a bucket that clearly had a hole and water strewn behind him. Abba Moses, what are you doing? He said, you have asked me to come cast judgment on my brother when my sins have run behind me. Ain't no one got time for that. If you're seriously taking your own self 
to God and taking yourself into account before God. Here's the truth. We all have the same temptation. It's to go to church and hear a sermon and think, man, I wish so-and-so heard that. It's to read a book and think about the lesson that someone else could get from it. Sometimes it's to sit comfortably in our pew and look with judgment about someone else in the room, how they look, how they act, how they speak. Here's a temptation we all suffer from. Simply thinking that the way we understand it, the way we live it, is pretty okay. And others, not so much. But the lesson from a story like this, from this dangerous story, is that when you stand before God, inside or outside the church, don't worry about other people. As the kids say, stay in your lane and deal honestly and humbly with God about your own heart. Our closing hymn is number 62, Creator God, Creating Still. Would you please stand as we join our voices one last time. with you friends. I will remind you tonight we have even song, our contemporary service at 5 p.m. in the chapel. The sermon's always different there. You can come to that and then stick around for some festivities in this space. All of you know that Herb Buffington is one of the finest church organists, well organists generally in the country and it is a real treat that he's going to come and dazzle us tonight and we hope that you make use of that not only with your listening ears but by bringing your friends as well. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity. Thank you Herb for, for doing that for us. Um, we have a lot of great things coming up, like our All Saints Day uh, service next week. Please, please see Dee Stone if you want to remember a loved one. And, of course, our spaghetti lunch and cake auction. So a lot going on in the life of this church. You can find out more at peachtree.org, your order of worship, or wherever you have social media ties to us. For now, I'll leave you with this blessing and hope to see you in the gathering space. May you always take your full heart to God and know that God will love you, and God will redeem you.
and God will make you whole. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ as you go this week. I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go now in peace. Thank you.